Well, good morning, everyone. Not on. Good morning. That's better. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Thank you so much for being flexible in regards to all the changes uh, that we need to make in regards to the changes that are sent our way. Uh, but we're so thankful that uh, you're here and have joined us this morning. A uh, couple quick announcements this morning. All of the COVID protocols apply, so masks on, social distance, use the back double doors to enter and exit just as you did. Uh, when we leave, uh, be patient, let people make their way uh, out of the foyer, and if you could, move beyond the doorway. Uh, people are starting to stop in this nice weather and it makes it difficult. If you can move away from the doors, that would be great. We won't take up an offering. If you brought something, you can deposit it in the book deposit box, which is on your right-hand side as you exit. If you're a visitor here, we'd love to know of your visit. Uh, you could help us by filling out a connection card. Uh, scan that QR code, go to the link, give us the information uh, that you're content to give us, and that would be great. But know that you're welcome, and we, gl we are glad that you are here and have joined uh, with us. There is congregational prayer tonight. It's at 6 p.m., and it'll be about an hour of uh, praying together. And just like you signed up for this uh, service, you need to sign up for congregational prayer, and you do that at the Eventbrite. You can scan that QR R code or just go to where you sign up for services. That would be uh, great. And finally, we have a men's ministry service planned for Saturday, April the 24th from 9 to 11, and uh, the, the topic of the teaching and the panel will be aspiring to eldership, and if you're a man, we'd love to have you there. Uh, and same thing, you need to sign up so that we can control the amount of people who come and so that we know who's coming, and you do that at that same location where you sign up for services. Uh, you have come, we have come in order to worship God. So my encouragement to you this morning is let's do that wholeheartedly with all of our mind and soul and strength. Uh, let's worship God. Well, good morning, West London. It is uh, service four here, and I'm just smiling because it doesn't get old seeing the family walk in the front door. So it's very good to see you all this morning, and uh, it's an honor to be with you this morning. Uh, this morning, Pastor Jude will be preaching on uh, the narrative from Luke of the road to Emmaus when the disciples were walking with Jesus and didn't recognize him. And then there's that moment when they see him and they know who he is. And it's one of my favorites, maybe partnered with when Mary thinks she's speaking to the gardener at the tomb. And she doesn't see Jesus until he says her name. And then she sees him as he really is. And that's my prayer for us this morning, that as we come and do sort of a familiar thing of singing and chatting and praying and listening to the word being preached, that we would see Jesus fully, that we would see him as he truly is, not as a figment of our imagination with characteristics that he doesn't possess, but that we would see him in all his glory and that it would change us that we too would shout, he's alive, we've seen Jesus, we've really seen him, and it would change how we enter into worship, and it would change how we obey him as we leave this building today. Psalm 34 says that those who look to the Lord are radiant, and their faces are never put to shame. So let's look to him this morning, and be radiant with his glory, and reflect him to the watching world, not only so that we see Jesus rightly, but so they see Jesus rightly through our lives. As you're able, please stand and sing as we look to Jesus. Things are 
a few sermons, many of the application points have encouraged us to see the examples of the disciples who are living out in steadfast, faithful obedience to Christ. And that's been the encouragement to us that we would go and do likewise. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, it's easy to hear the sermon and say, yep, that's a very good point, and then not make any application on, say, Tuesday morning or Thursday afternoon to the same effect. And so I really need Maybe you need to take some time today to pray and ask the Lord to show us areas in our lives where we're not living in faithful obedience to Christ, ways where our lives do not line up with his word. So over these next two songs, let's spend some time declaring who Christ is. The fact that we have a life to live is because he lives and he gave us his life. So we ought to live it for his glory. The word says that we are not our own, but we're bought with a price. So we ought to glorify him in our body. So let's do that. Let's take time to thank God for the life he's given us. And then to confess that the only way to live is according to his word. And ask him to show us what that looks like for us individually. Let's continue to sing. <laughs>
make incense rise before you the lifting of my hands a sacrifice oh lord jesus turn your eyes upon me for i know there is mercy in your sight your statutes are my heritage forever Set on keeping your decrees. Please still my anxious search toward rebellion. Let love keep my will upon its knees. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. is going to come and lead us in prayer.
Good morning, West London. Um, over the past couple of weeks, we've had an opportunity to uh, remember the, uh, the promise at Easter, a promise that was just not uh, the fulfillment of a historical promise uh, to the people of Israel, but uh, a promise that uh, lives today in the uh, life and resurrection of Christ. And uh, Christ promised that to Martha uh, when Lazarus had passed away. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, yet will he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And that's a promise that uh, uh, is made to us. And so uh, there was a, a prayer uh, in uh, Christianity today, years ago, that um, I would like to pray with us today, um, that we'll go through that together, uh, praying back that promise to Christ as we uh, pray together as a church body. So let's go to prayer. O risen Lord, be our resurrection and life. Be the resurrection and the life for us, and all whom you have made. Be the resurrection and the life for those caught in the grip of sin and addiction. Be the resurrection and the life for those who feel forsaken. Be the resurrection and the life for those who live as if you do not. Be the resurrection and the life for those who do not believe that they need resurrection and life. Be the resurrection and the life in churches that believe they are dying and in churches who do not know that they are dead. Be the resurrection and the life in us who know the good but fail to do it, who have not been judged but still judge, who know love but still live for self, who know hope but succumb to despair. Be the resurrection and the life for those dying of malnutrition and hunger. Be the resurrection and life for those imprisoned unjustly and those imprisoned justly. Be the resurrection and life for those who live under regimes that seek to crush all who proclaim resurrection and life. Be the resurrection and the life for those in the throes of sickness that leads to death. Be the resurrection and the life in families where the weak are maltreated by the strong, and be the resurrection and the life in marriages that are disintegrating. Be the resurrection and the life for women trafficked and enslaved by the forces of wickedness. Be the resurrection and the life for those whose lives are snuffed out in the womb. Be the resurrection and the life for the children and the young people here at Westland and Alliance Church. Be the resurrection and the life for those in our church body who are suffering from physical uh, ailments, emotional and relational challenges. In particular, we think of Ken Randall battling cancer. Lord, be that resurrection and life that they need in their lives. And Lord, we pray that you'd be the resurrection and the life for the international workers for the Alliance as they minister overseas through difficult times uh, with COVID. Lord, we pray that you would be the resurrection and the life for anyone, anywhere. Lord, we lift this up to you and thank you for the promise you have made to each and every one of us. And we look forward, Lord, to celebrating that as we uh, gather together today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning we continue on in our sermon series uh, through the Gospel of Luke. This is my favorite story in the Gospels about Jesus. Jesus appears to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Let's go right to Scripture this morning, Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Luke 24, 13 through 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. 
While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. I would articulate the main idea from this passage this way. Jesus' appearance to the disciples on the road to Emmaus is verification of the resurrection of Jesus, the redemption of Jesus, and the vindication of Jesus. Let me say that again. Jesus' appearance to the disciples on the road to Emmaus is verification of the resurrection of Jesus, the redemption of Jesus, and the vindication of Jesus. Let's begin with the resurrection of Jesus. In his retelling of events of Resurrection Sunday, Luke has thus far omitted any mention of Jesus appearing to anyone. Nobody has seen Jesus. Nobody has heard directly from Jesus. At least not that Luke has mentioned. And yet now Jesus appears to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. With dramatic flair, Luke conveys this information so that the reader knows a third traveler is Jesus, but the two disciples don't know who he is. We read that they were kept from recognizing him. And the most likely explanation is that it was God who was preventing them from realizing who the traveler was. And yet, Luke, like all the other Gospels, needed at some point to verify the resurrection of Jesus by his appearance in the body to his disciples. Luke is the only Gospel writer to give this account of an appearance of Jesus. And yet, all of the Gospels record at least 11 times that Jesus appeared in the flesh to his disciples, to hundreds of individuals over a period of several weeks. Now, these, all of these accounts share that verification of the resurrection. And clearly, this is something important. It's so important, in fact, that Paul includes the appearances of Jesus as those things he deems to be of first importance. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 7, we read, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. The resurrection of Jesus is verified as he appears to the disciples in flesh. We also have verification of the redemption of Jesus. This isn't speaking of Jesus being redeemed, but rather the redemption that Jesus has accomplished. 
Jesus' accomplishing of redemption was verified when people saw him after the resurrection. Now, these two disciples on the way to Emmaus are clearly disappointed. And they sum up their frustration saying, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. See, they had an idea about redemption, but it was not in line with God's idea about redemption and what God had ordained and planned to happen. And so they didn't believe that redemption had occurred yet. We come to understand through Scripture that there is a wide range of words and ideas associated with redemption. There's the idea of setting free from bonds by the paying of a ransom. There's the idea linked to the marketplace, which is connected with the idea of buying something back that used to be yours. There's also the related concept that pertains to the emancipation of slaves. Well, as we take all of these ideas, the constant theme In these facets of redemption is the idea of bondage and liberation. And the New Testament makes it clear that the redemption of Jesus in its most comprehensive sense consists of the deliverance from the bondage to sin. And the New Testament also makes it clear that forgiveness of sins is impossible. Redemption is impossible if Jesus remains dead. Again, from 1 Corinthians 15, 17 through 19, Paul writes, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Brothers and sisters, the opposite is true. If Christ has been raised, our faith is not futile and we are not still in our sins. See, redemption requires the forgiveness of sins and the forgiveness of sins requires that Jesus not remain dead. If we place our faith in a dead Savior, we have no redemption. But if our Savior conquered death, and we put our faith in him and surrender our lives to him, we can be confident that our sins are forgiven and that we have been redeemed. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, you've never entrusted yourself to Christ, let me encourage you. The resurrection matters. Apart from the resurrection of Christ, there is no redemption, but we believe that God raised him from the dead. And if you will put your faith in him, and surrender to your your life to him, you can find forgiveness, reconciliation to God the Father, and eternal life. So Jesus' appearance to the disciples is not only a verification of his resurrection, but also a verification of the redemption he has accomplished. And finally, it's a verification of his vindication. Jesus was vindicated as the Messiah by the resurrection. That is to say, the resurrection verified that Jesus was God's Savior and God's Son, and that He was victorious in His sacrificial death and achieved the ends for which that it was intended to achieve. To vindicate is to prove that what someone said or did was right or true, even after other people thought it was wrong. Well, Jesus' appearance after his resurrection was proof that he was right about who he said he was and he was right about what he said he'd do. This is what Jesus is aiming at with his rhetorical question to the two disciples. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? For Jesus to enter into his glory is for him to enter into exaltation at God's right hand whereby he is given rule and authority over all things. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, Paul begins this wonderful letter saying, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, 
And then in verse 4, he says, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. It's the resurrection from the dead that declares Jesus to be the Son of God in power. Jesus is showing these two disciples that their grief at his death, though perhaps understandable, is nevertheless short-sighted. He calls them fools. He indicates that they should have known from Scripture. Because the Old Testament prophets taught that the victorious king must first be the dying king. But a dead king is not a reigning king, and so the dead king must be resurrected. And he was. And his appearance to the disciples verifies that he has been vindicated. Let me finish this morning by applying this passage to our lives in a very specific way. Very specific thing that these two disciples were wrestling with that I think applies to us in this day during this pandemic. We may find that ultimately the most difficult and dangerous manifestation of the COVID virus are not related to physical health, are not related to economic health, but are related to spiritual health. The great danger that we may be facing in this day could be the very thing that those two disciples were facing and dealing with on the road to Emmaus. In preparing this sermon, I listened to a a sermon on this passage by Martin Lloyd-Jones, and I commend him to you. I think he's probably the best preacher of the 20th century. If you Google his name, you can go to his website and you can put in the passage and you'll hear his sermon. But he notes in his sermon that the two disciples on the road to Emmaus were succumbing to what he called sad-heartedness and slow-heartedness. He points to verse 17 where we read, And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. And then in verse 25, and he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. They had a heart problem. It didn't pertain to the organ that pumps blood. It was spiritual malaise that they were working through as they walked on the road to Emmaus. And so we can ask our question, will heart problems be the greatest injury the deepest trauma, the most perilous harm that we experience going through this pandemic. Many of us are already displaying symptoms of these heart ailments. And so we might ask, what is the remedy for saddened and slow hearts? Well, before we consider the remedy, let's diagnose the problem. The story we have considered today helps us in regards to this. You see, sad and slow hearts are the symptoms. But what caused them? What caused these two disciples to be sad-hearted and slow-hearted? Let me suggest three things. First of all, suffering. The suffering of Jesus and their own suffering as they experienced and witnessed their Savior, their Messiah dying, led to this sad-heartedness and this slow-heartedness. Secondly, unmet expectations. Clearly, they were looking for political redemption instead of spiritual redemption. They had expectations about what redemption looked like, and those expectations were not met. And so they were sad-hearted and slow-hearted. And what I already mentioned, short-sightedness. They could not see beyond the death of Jesus. I think that's helpful for today. People are suffering today. People are suffering physically from the virus. But so much more than that, because of all the lockdowns and restrictions and the change in a lifestyle, people are are suffering mentally through loneliness and, and depression and despair. And there's relational suffering as there's conflict in in churches, in families, at work, at school. There's economic suffering as we go through this. And there is a whole heap of unmet expectations because of this. If you're not sure about that, ask one of the seven couples who are getting married this summer. 
if they had expectations about their wedding that aren't going to be met because of COVID. But it goes beyond that to funerals. People have lost loved ones and held funerals that didn't meet their expectations of what they thought they would experience. There's anniversaries. There are young kids. Talk to them about not getting to go to their prom or their grad or losing school sports or not being able to go on trips or vacations. COVID has brought us to a place of a whole bunch of unmet expectations. And I think we have short-sightedness too. Just as the disciples couldn't see beyond the death of Jesus, it's hard for us to see beyond this global pandemic. And so I suggest to you that we are at risk in these days of slow-heartedness and sad-heartedness. When the call on disciples is not to be slow-hearted and not to be sad-hearted, but to have burning-heartedness. The very core of our being, the very core of who we are, we need to have a fire burning that is our zeal for our Savior, Jesus Christ. The remedy for sad-heartedness and slow-heartedness is burning-heartedness. So how do we get that? How do we get that burning heart? Let me suggest to you it's not by thoughts that are evidenced by these sorts of rhetorical questions. Did not our hearts burn within us when we could finally take these masks off? Did not our hearts burn within us when we could gather the church without social distancing? Did not our hearts burn within us when our government stopped trying to be so controlling? Didn't our hearts burn within us when these restrictions were removed? Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I don't want any of these things. I'm sick and tired of them. I want to be finished with them. But if you think the remedy for sad-heartedness and slow-heartedness is found in those things, you are going to be sorely disappointed. If you think the recipe for a burning heart is related ultimately to the removal of some restrictions, you are in for a rude awakening. Now think about the disciples. They didn't even say this. They didn't say, did not our hearts burn within us when we realized that Jesus was with us in the flesh? Their hearts, when they were burned, they still didn't know it was Jesus. Their hearts didn't burn because they knew Jesus was with them. They tell us, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened us to us the Scripture? Their heart was burning before they even realized it was Jesus. And so we come to the place this morning where we understand the remedy for sad-heartedness and the remedy for slow-heartedness in the midst of this pandemic is the expounding of God's Word so that we can understand who Jesus is and we can understand what Jesus has done. And as we do so, that will ignite our hearts. It will burst into flames with excitement and adoration of our Savior. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, if we had Jesus expounding the Scriptures to us, we would have hearts aflame as well. But we only have you, Pastor Jude. Fair enough. Fair enough, I'm not Jesus. But understand this, brothers and sisters. Understand this. Each and every one of you has the author of Scripture abiding in your hearts to teach you about Jesus. The question is really not about who's behind this pulpit. It's not about who's leading your life group or who's doing the teaching and the gathering. The question is, where are you going to seek for the remedy for your saddened and slow heart? You see, the heart remedy we need is not determined by the decisions of the government. It's It's not determined by the decision of our elders responding to the restrictions of the government. It's not determined even by your response to what you're told to do. Rather, our remedy is found by going to God's Word, by inviting the Holy Spirit to open the Scriptures to us that we might see Jesus, that we might see Him in all His glory, who He is and what He has done 
to save us. Brothers and sisters, as you wrestle with a heart that's saddened, as you wrestle with slow-heartedness in the core of your being, go to God's Word. Ask His Spirit to open the Scriptures up to you that you might see who Jesus is and what He has done through His death and resurrection. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You for Your Word. I pray, Father God, I pray for my brothers and sisters, I pray for myself, that as we deal with sad hearts and slow hearts, as we deal with spiritual malaise in the innermost parts of our being, would you help us? Would you help us to resolve to go to your word and to ask your spirit to open it up to us that we might see Jesus? We believe that as we see him, our hearts will raise up in flames, rejoicing, reveling in all that Christ is and all that Christ has done. You have gloriously given us your spirit. And I pray, Father God, that your spirit would help us to see Jesus Christ crucified and raised from the dead. It's in his name we pray. Amen. As you leave this morning, brothers and sisters, as you consider this wonderful story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus and the appearance of Jesus for the first time in the Gospel of Luke after his death, I pray that you will reflect on your own heart, on your own heart in regards to this situation, this difficult situation that we're facing. And that as you recognize perhaps a saddened heart or a slow heart, any, any ailment of the heart, the core of your being, the, the spiritual malaise that comes from the suffering or the unmet expectations of these days or even our own short-sightedness, my prayer is, is that you would call out to God, go to his word, ask his spirit to open it up to you that you might see Jesus and your heart will start burning. May the Lord be with you.